Let's go to our sermon time. I want you to open your Bibles, please, to the Gospel of John, St. John, chapter 10. St. John, chapter 10. John, chapter 10, and I'm going to begin with verse 27 down through verse 30. John 10, beginning at verse 27, Christ says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Years ago, I was speaking to a couple, husband and wife, and they were both from Pentecostal church denominations. We were talking about the subject of eternal security. Once you're saved, are you saved eternally? Or can you lose it? How do I know that I'm saved? And I quoted part of verse 29 to these people, no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. And the lady said something to me that caught me off guard. She said, that's true. No one can take your salvation from you. But if you get yourself out of the father's hand, that becomes a different matter. You, you lose your salvation, which I didn't know how to respond to at the time. I was much younger and wasn't as diligent in the Bible as I try to be now. I thought later, why would anyone want to do that? Why would they want to take themselves out of the safe hands of the Lord Jesus Christ? And I also thought, no man, wouldn't that also include you? If they can't do it, neither can you do it. The Pentecostal brethren, and I say that respectfully, I mean the Church of God, the Assemblies of God, the four square denomination and some of the charismatic groups that have sprung out of them believe that salvation is by grace through faith, just as we do. They believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, just as we do. They just don't believe that it's permanent. They believe that it can be jeopardized through some sin, some fault, some action of yours after the fact. You might lose it if you're not careful by your own sin, your own rebellion against God, your own disobedience in some form. I have a friend here in town, a, a Baptist friend. I've known him as long as I've known the other people. He believes in salvation by grace through faith, just as we do. He believes that uh, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, as we do. But his church also teaches that you can lose your salvation if you're not careful through some sin, some disobedience, some fleshly living on your part. You can undo the perfect salvation that God has wrought in your soul. God has effected in you. It can all be undone um, if you're not careful as to how you live afterwards. Uh, they are known as free will Baptists. The difference between the free will Baptists and the Pentecostal brethren, uh, the main difference, let me say, is that the, the Baptists just don't emphasize speaking in tongues and some of these other, you know, TBN, Paul and Jan Crouch type uh, gifts, you know, slain in the spirit and barking like a dog and a number of other things. Both of those groups believe that man has a free will, but it's the free will that can then get him in trouble after he trusts Jesus Christ, if he's not careful. He can jeopardize or he can ruin, he can extinguish his own salvation through sin and through disobedience and through carnal life or carnal living and so forth. There's another church near us, up and around the corner. They believe that man has no free will. God couldn't trust you with a free will. You would make the wrong decisions. 
And therefore, God had to decide in eternity past who he would save, and he decided who he would not save. These are called the two eternal decrees of Calvin, uh, Calvinistic doctrine. And this is called the sovereign grace of God. He decides who he will save, and you had no decision in the process whatsoever because God couldn't trust you to make the right decision. So God decided who he would save and who he would not save. If God has chosen you and you are one of the elect, then you're on your way to heaven no matter what you do, if you carry it to its logical extreme, logical conclusion. But if he hasn't chosen you, he's already decided he's going to damn you to hell one day, there's no way you can go to heaven no matter how hard you try, no matter what you do. That's already been decided by him before you were ever born, before the heaven and earth were ever created. All three of these groups believe that someone's salvation is somehow contingent or dependent upon the act of their free will. Either they, their free will gets them in trouble or they don't have a free will, so God has to do it for them. But when you think about it, neither one of these groups believe in eternal security. Because if I'm too carnal and fleshly, I don't know if I've lost it and I have to get it back again or if I still have it. And if I'm a Calvinist, I don't know if I'm one of the elect or not. So neither group really has the assurance of eternal security. We don't believe those things. We believe that uh, when God saves you, he saves you for sure, for certain, and forever. I have a friend, Mark Randolph. We worked together for Chick Publications years ago. He's the one that introduced me to Dr. Ruckman's ministry. And there was a Pentecostal lady who we worked with, and she asked him one day, Mark, do you believe once saved, always saved? And he said, oh, no, no. I believe once born, always born. <laughs> Peter says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. First Peter 1 23. If the word of God lives and abides forever and your salvation is based upon you trusting the word of God and believing what you read in the Bible, then won't your salvation last forever also? Amen. The Bible says for precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept. Line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. Isaiah 28, verse 10. We're supposed to be rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. To compare scripture with scripture and let the scriptures interpret the scriptures. Let them interpret themselves. By doing that, you can then discern what might apply to you and what might apply to someone else. This is called rightly dividing the word of truth. And I'm happy to report, based upon the scriptures, after reading their literature, after talking with people who believe those things, we're right, they're wrong. <laughs> That's my title today. We're right, they're wrong. I'm not interested in what the Bible means, and I'm not interested in what the Bible teaches. I want to know what the Bible says. Amen. If I know what the Bible says, then the right teaching should naturally follow, shouldn't it? I would imagine so. Write this down as point number one. All Christians are heading for judgment. All Christians are heading for judgment. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 tells us, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body. According to that, he hath done, whether it be good or bad. The Apostle Paul didn't write, most of us will appear. Some of us will appear. Those of us who are still saved when the rapture takes place will appear. He said, all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, if you were saved and somehow undid it, you ruined it, you destroyed it, you lost it, that wouldn't apply to you anymore, would it? You wouldn't be in that number who's heading towards the judgment of Christians. 
He said, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 13 to 15. All Christians are heading for a judgment of their works as a Christian. It's not a judgment to see if you make it to heaven. That was decided the day, the moment, the hour you trusted Jesus Christ to be your Savior. The day you asked God to forgive me, save my soul. I believe Jesus died for me. Please save me. That decided whether you're going to heaven or not. God is interested in what you've done for him since that time. And that will be the judgment seat of Christ, which all Christians are heading towards. So God's interested in what you've been doing in the name of Jesus Christ. What have you done since God saved you? We have a young man who got saved yesterday. One day God's going to want to see what Nathan does for Jesus Christ until the rapture, until Christ calls him home. God will be interested in that. God's interested in you. He wants to know what you're doing for the sake of Jesus Christ, for the honor of Jesus Christ, between now and the day he calls you home. That's a sobering thought. You ought to keep that in mind if you're a true believer. Don't be worrying about, you know, am I going to lose it? Have I lost it? Do I do something to jeopardize it? Do I have to speak in tongues? Do I have to get slain in the spirit? Do I have to give money to TBN? Do I have to do a number of things to make sure I don't lose it? Stop fooling around with whether you can lose or not. Uh, do something positive. Do something productive for the sake of Jesus Christ. Get your nose in your Bible. Start reading what God wants you to know. Don't sit around just watching the internet or watching TV preachers or listening to the radio. Read the Bible on your own. Amen. Can't tell the players without a program, that guy at Dodger Stadium says, right? <laughs> Secondly, let me say this. All Christians have eternal life now. They have eternal life now. It's not something you're waiting to attain, hoping to achieve one day. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, present tense, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. John 5, verse 24. The New Testament never describes conditional life or temporary life, but eternal, everlasting life to those who are trusting Jesus Christ. That's also one of the best proof texts, John 5, 24, you can offer to show someone will not, a Christian will not be going through the tribulation. Someone in the tribulation's salvation will not be as simple as by grace through faith plus nothing like it is now. If you read your Bible, if you're not a stupid, uh, lazy Christian, you start reading your Bible, you'll see the plan of salvation after the rapture takes place will be a matter of faith coupled with works. John, or rather, Revelation 12, 14, Revelation 14, verse 17, just to name a couple of texts. Faith and works coupled together. The person's salvation in the tribulation will depend upon them not receiving the mark of the beast. It will depend upon them not worshiping the Antichrist. It will depend upon them helping the Jew in his worst time of affliction or lose his head trying. I'm saved now. I'm already born again. I'm already saved. That was settled November 5th, 1967 when I, as a six-year-old boy, said yes to Jesus Christ and he saved me. From that day till now, I've known for sure I'm going to heaven. We'll get to that thought in a few minutes. But uh, I'm not waiting to pass some future test. I'm saved already. Amen. By the way, if the church goes through the tribulation, think of it this way. If the church has to go through the tribulation, as a lot of morons on the internet are saying now, that means then there is no tribulation, is there? It's effectively still the church age. If the church is still here, I don't know why people can't 
see the, 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 the forest for the trees. Secondly, well, I've already said, secondly, all Christians have eternal life now. You have it now. You're not waiting to attain it. You're not waiting to obtain it. You're not waiting to achieve it uh, through some future test, passing some future uh, trial. Thirdly, let me say this. All Christians are sealed by God now. You're sealed by God now. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Ephesians 4, verse 30. You're already sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. You belong to the Heavenly Father. You're waiting to get a new body and have it all put together. Have your transformation made complete one day. Paul says, but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, or that is, the redemption of our body. Romans 8, verse 23. The day of redemption will be when you finally get a new body, a brand new body. I want a new one today. Until then, you're sealed by God. You belong to him. You're waiting for your new body to finally arrive and your transformation be made complete. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 1, verse 12. And then John clarifies that even more. Beloved, now are we the sons of God? And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John 3, verse 2. According to the scriptures, not according to Pastor Shrive, not according to Bible Baptist Church International, but according to the scriptures, a Christian has eternal life now. He's sealed by the Holy Spirit now. The Bible calls the Holy Spirit the earnest of our expectation. Earnest is a legal word. It means a down payment. It's used in real estate. It's used in legal transactions. It's a down payment of something you're going to pay later on. If the Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, lives inside of me, and he's there forever, and that's simply the down payment what more does God have waiting for me? Or for you, for that matter. That's how you ought to look at it. But you're sealed by the Holy Spirit now. And you are said to be a son of God now. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. He's simply waiting for that new body and his transformation to be made complete. But he's sealed by God now. Point number four. A Christian is kept by the power of God now. He's kept saved by God now. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. 1 Peter 1, verses 4 and 5. Peter also alludes to the glory of that the believer will have with a new body one day in that passage. But until then, it's God who keeps you saved. He does the saving. You don't do it. He has to do the keeping. You can't do it. Listen, if you have the power to destroy your salvation, then you have the power to attain it. That's the other, that's the other side of the coin. If you have the power necessary to destroy the salvation that God effects, then you also have the power to attain it. Let me see you do it. You can't do it. God does the saving. All you do is the trusting. God washes you clean from the consequence of your sin. He washes you clean from the guilt of your sin. Uh, his, by the power of his shed blood, he cleanses your soul from the stain of whatever sin you ever committed. He cleanses your, you, you the, the guilt of your flesh, the, of your thoughts, the desires and lusts and affections of your heart. He cleanses you of everything. He makes sure your name is written in heaven. 
in permanent ink. He has a mansion prepared for you. He's regenerated your dead spirit by the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you now. I would submit to you that no Christian fully understands everything that God does for him when he saves him. And if you don't fully understand everything God has done for you when he saved you, how can you then be responsible for hanging on to it, making sure you don't lose it? The idea that if I'm not careful, I can undo it. I can jeopardize it. I can uh, terminate it. I can put it into it. I can get rid of it. I can destroy it. That's actually a, a sign of arrogance and pride. I'm able to do it. Like I say, if you're able to destroy it, then logically you must be able to, to earn it. Let me see you do that. You can't do it. Point number five, all Christians, and this is the one the world hates, all Christians can know that they're saved Amen. right now. Amen. There, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Well, that's me. That you, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe in the name of the Son of God. 1 John 5, verse 13. 1 John 5, verse 13. If God's book says that you can know it, and somebody else says you can't know it, who are you going to believe? I would rather believe what's written on the pages of the Bible than believe my Pentecostal friends who say you might be in danger of losing it. In Roman Catholicism, this is called the sin of presumption. To presume that you're saved, to say, I know that I'm saved. This, it's called the sin of presumption. You can look it up. Uh, that's what the bishops and the cardinals teach, the sin of presumption, that I can be saved and know it for sure without having to depend upon the steps prescribed by the church, confessing to a priest and taking the sacraments and so forth. We call that a lot of nonsense. They can call it what they want, but we call it nonsense. People don't like to have that kind of certainty. They don't want that kind of cert certitude and, and absolutism. They want to keep salvation sort of tenuous and vague so that it's somehow up to them to hang on to it. Look at me. Look what I can do. I can hang on to it. I'm such a holy, uh, righteous person. Uh, there's no way I can ever lose it because I'm living such a close. You're full of pride. You know what? That's what you are. There's nothing I could do to ever earn my salvation. God had to save me. All I could do was the trusting. I'm glad that I did so. They can always say it depends on them. I did it my way. That's a, that's a theme song for everybody in hell. I did it my way. The Bible says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 1, verse 6. God's going to finish what he started in you. That's why I said the Holy Spirit is simply said to be a down payment of what more God intends to give you one day. The Bible says, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. God wants you to be confident of your salvation. He wants you to be confident that he's taking care of everything. He's doing what you cannot do. He's working behind the scenes to keep Satan at bay, to give you strength by the Holy Spirit and strength through the scriptures over temptation, to give you some uh, sense of assurance and comfort that you're not left alone. You have Christian friends praying for you. You have a conscience that somehow uh, activates when you know you're about to do something that would be displeasing to God. Before you ever trusted Jesus Christ, that never bothered you. But now it does. I wish the Pentecostal brethren could enjoy the confidence that comes from knowing that they're saved and that God saves them for sure, for certain, and forever. And I say brethren uh, respectfully because some of my dearest friends have been uh, people from Pentecostal churches. It's just unfortunate that they're shallow in their Bible studies. Ever since they stumbled over and tripped over Acts chapter 2, the Holy Ghost coming upon them, the altar one speaking with other tongues, over a hundred years ago when their denominations began to spring up. They've been bad Bible students ever since then. Somehow suicide 
will destroy your salvation. That's something else they preach. And one text they use for that, they also misinterpret. But um, I'm glad God does the saving. I'm glad he does the keeping. The Bible says that God hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 2, verse 6. Part of you is already seated in heaven, in the, in the third heaven, with Jesus Christ. It's like I said a few minutes ago, you're waiting for this body to be changed and your transformation com, uh, fully complete. Until that day comes, you're going to struggle with the old nature and the new nature, that old part of you that wants to satisfy itself and get away and cut corners and cheat and do things the, the fleshly way, another way that wants to please Jesus Christ and honor Jesus Christ, give something of yourself, yield yourself to the one who was willing to die for your sake and suffer on your behalf. The two natures are always at conflict with each other. The old nature of the flesh, the new nature of the spirit. By the way, psychologists and a lot of philosophers have talked about two natures in man. The physical nature and the moral or the selfless nature in man. Part of you wants to satisfy yourself. Part of you wants to do something noble to please God, perhaps. And it used to be depicted in cartoons with a little devil on one shoulder and a little angel on the other shoulder, right there whispering in your ear and so forth. You see the little, well, I shouldn't get illustrated. The, you see it illustrated, the, the devil and the angel in those uh, uh, truck mud flap cutouts, the silver shiny girls, you know, but it's the same idea. There's an old nature and a new nature, and they're always conflict with each other. But there's a third nature that a lot of these people ignore. They neglect. The third nature is the soul. The soul is the real you. And the soul is being pulled in one of two directions. Which way do I go? That's why every day you have to renew your, your confidence in Jesus Christ. You don't renew your salvation. That's already settled. But you yield yourself to him every day, saying, God, whatever this day holds, lead me through it. Give me grace. Give me wisdom. Guard everything I say. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. And put off the old nature. You might have prayed yesterday, and yesterday might have been a great day, but you have to do it again today. You can't live today on yesterday's blessings. Every day you wake up is a new day. As my sister-in-law was testifying uh, earlier, every day is a new day you thank God for and uh, say, God, give me strength, give me faith, give me patience to get through this day in such a way that pleases you and honors Jesus Christ. The Apostle John wrote, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. 1 John 4, verses 18 and 19. If a man or a woman is afraid that they're going to lose their salvation, if they're afraid that God may take it away because of some sin or action on their part, if they're afraid that it can be undone because of something stupid they ended up doing, they indulged in sin, they did something to agree the Holy Spirit, they therefore have undone the salvation, they've untied the knot that God tied. That person is in torment, you know that? That person is in torment, mentally and spiritually, because they don't know if they lost it or not. Fear hath torment. But you can know that you're saved, which brings me to the, my last point. All Christians are secure in the love of God now. They're secure in the love of God. In Romans 8, verses 38 and 39 tell us, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Have you found the love of God in Christ Jesus? Amen. I did. I have. God doesn't just throw out a blanket of love out there in the ether that uh, sort of floats on everybody. It doesn't matter where you 
what church you go to, or what doctrine you believe, or what book you're reading, or you don't believe. It's just sort of out there, and everybody can partake, partake of it. God deposited his love at a certain point in time in human history. When Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross of Calvary for the sake of all sinners. And that's where you have to go to receive the love of God. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. That's where you find the love of God. Have you gone there trusting Jesus Christ as a sinner to receive the love of God? The greatest love that was ever displayed in human history was when Jesus Christ died for the sake of sinners, suffered on behalf of sinners. Christ himself said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. John 15 Verse 13, it doesn't get any better than that. Perfect love, which Christ displayed, casted out fear. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You say, well, my Bible says a new creation. Well, your Bible's wrong. The new creation... God made was a body of believers made up of Jews and Gentiles called the church. That's the new creation. Members of that church are creatures. Don't get confused about that. Just assume that God gave you a book you can trust from cover to cover and throw all the others out. The Bible tells us that God hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. There's part of me that's in the third heaven now. There's part of you in the third heaven now. That's why it doesn't take 100,000 light years for your prayer to traverse the universe and get to the North Star, wherever heaven, the heavenly home of God is. Let me ask this. What kind of spirit leads a man to study the Bible looking for a way to lose it? Think about that. What kind of spirit would lead someone into the Bible trying to find verses that would undo his salvation? Does that sound like the work of the Holy Spirit? Is that the work of the Comforter? If a man or woman is in Jesus Christ, they are saved. They are saved for sure, for certain, forever. God keeps them saved. Uh, they're heading for judgment as a Christian. God's interested in what they're doing for Jesus' sake. They possess everlasting life right now. They're sealed by the Holy Spirit of God right now. They're called a new creature by Jesus Christ, by God right now. They can have confidence that they're saved. They are kept by the power of God now, not by their own efforts, not by their own good behavior. And they've trusted the most perfect love that was ever displayed or offered in the universe and they should have no fear of ever losing it ever going to hell dr ruckman used to talk about a lady who was always doubting her salvation her husband was a preacher for some reason his wife could never have confidence and assurance that she was saved she was afraid she might lose it she had been trained or conditioned growing up that uh, if i'm not careful i might undo the work of god and he said you're trusting Something to keep you out of hell, aren't you? She said, yes. What are you trusting? I'm trusting the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And he said, I got bad news for you, sister. Of course, she got frightened. He said, you're, got to, you're going to heaven whether you want to or not. If you're trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're trusting what he did for your sake on the cross of Calvary, then all you can do is to trust. You have to let him do the rest. All of this belongs to the Christian who is in Jesus Christ. Now, let me finish with this. How does a person get into Jesus Christ? By asking Christ into them. The Lord Jesus said, at that, at that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. John 14, verse 20. It's a very simple transaction. And this is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. 
He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. 1 John 5, verses 11 and 12. I'm glad that I have him. Do you know him as your Savior? If you do, say amen. Amen. Now, good. I'm glad that I, I, I've trusted the most perfect love that was ever offered. I'm glad there was nothing I could do to earn it or justify it or merit it or attract it. But I latched onto it because it was offered to me, and I would have been a fool not to do so. And uh, I've been a foolish person. I've been a, a lousy Christian many times, but I've never been sorry that I was a Christian, nor I've ever doubted it. And uh, a Christian should never doubt that God has saved him if he's trusted uh, the eternal salvation of Jesus Christ 